I've been, I always think a lot, as, I've been teaching this class for a million years, and I always think a lot about how important the sampling distribution idea is, right? And I also think about how difficult it is to understand the sampling distribution. So after the last class, I went back to my office, and I was scouring the internet for information, not just videos about this. How you, what's a great way to explain the sampling distribution? Um, to people so that they understand it. I did find, a, I found several videos which I will email to you. Um, and, and what I think I'd like to do is, this guy's kind of nutty, um, this video guy. But he actually, the content is good. I don't like his hat and I don't like the way he acts, but that's all right. But the content is good. And I'd like to show it, I'd like to talk about it as we go through it. Because unless we really understand the sampling distribution, when we go forward, things get pretty ugly. So um, anyway, and, and, it, and I and watching all of these videos, I watched about 10 or 15 of them. But in watching all of them, I'm rem they all say pretty much the same thing as I say about how difficult the concepts are in statistics to understand. So. Please don't take this lightly, or I'm not just showing you a video just so you could sit there and go to sleep or whatever, right? I want to show this video. I want to talk about it as it's going on, and maybe we'll look at another one. But I don't want to move on until I'm sure that you understand the sampling distribution um, thoroughly. Okay, so this guy here, I don't know who he is, but again, I'll email all the links that I found uh, when I go back to my office after class today. So, and he talks loud too. Sampling distributions. It's important that you understand this idea of sampling distributions. And the big part of sampling. By the way, the first thing I wanted to say, and one I like that he's emphasizing the word sampling. Remember, I wrote it on the whiteboard last time. Sample distribution is not this, right? We have what are the three distributions that we have? Say it loud, somebody that never says anything. For fifty points on your final grade, <laughs> just kidding. I did that the other night in a restaurant with my kids. I said for twenty dollars, who did whatever, and my daughter knew it, and I had to pay up. Right so, um, what are the three populations that I wrote on the board that we're concerned with right now? Do you remember? Do you remember, Randall? No. Okay, that's fair, by the way. I don't feel bad. I don't remember what happened this morning. So. How about you, Cameron? Do you remember? Is it the population sampling distribution and sampling? That's exactly what it is. The population. The sample that we pull from the population and the sampling distribution, which connects them. And what I kind of liked about his approach is he, he does it a lot. He keeps emphasizing sampling distribution. It's not the sample distribution, right? And this is all about the sampling distribution, which links the sample to the population. Sampling distribution is the ING. Because the way you get a sampling distribution is by sampling and 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 sampling. Let me explain. There are two sampling distributions that you're introduced to early, and there's a couple more we'll talk about later on, but this is the first one you're going to talk about are the sampling distribution for proportions and the sampling distribution for means. Which, by the way, is exactly how your author get what proportions and means. The, a proportion is a statistic, right? And a, and a mean is a, can be a statistic too, right? Let's talk about how we get those things. So imagine, uh, let's talk about uh, proportions first. Suppose that I told you, or we knew that 20% uh, of the people were sexy and they knew it. So let's suppose 20% of the people are sexy and they know it, actually out there in the population. So that would be the parameter. The actual population, 20%, 20 Remember that word, right? Parameter. Populations have parameters or characteristics, and samples have statistics. Other people were sexy and they know it. So I say P equals 0.20, okay? P is the proportion of the population. But if I go and take a sample of 100 people, 
Do you think exactly 20 people will be sexy in Aeolian? Do you think that's going to happen? No, because if I take this sample over here, maybe only 18 people are sexy and they know it. If I take another sample, a random sample again, maybe only 20, maybe 17 are. Then I take another sample, maybe 24 are. But most of those samples, close to about 20, will be sexy and they'll know it. So um, that number, 20 over 100, or 22 over 100, or 21 over 100, would be the proportion in my sample. A sample proportion is known as a p-hat. So if you can imagine... A sample proportion is known as a p-hat. That's not in your book, but our, our book calls it something different. Your author calls a sample proportion that, p subscript s, right? In statistics, though, or when you read articles, you might see it referred to as a p with a little hat, little, right? And sometimes they make it with a bar, P with a bar or P with a hat, right? They all mean the same thing. So when you see these little letters in these articles that your professors make you read, right? That's all they mean. It, it takes a minute to understand what they are and life becomes beautiful once you understand what they are, okay? So I'm gonna just back up a hair. Triple proportion is known as a P hat. So if you can imagine this, me going out, me show you, I'll show you a little scale here, and we get about 20, 25, 30, 15, and 10%. What's he writing there? What do those numbers mean? What do these numbers mean? Why is he writing these numbers down? What are they? Uh, what's that? What do you think they are? What's he doing? What's he want to know? about the population. The percentage. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. The percentage? Sorry. Well, he wants to know the percentage or the proportion of what? <coughs> of the, what's he doing? I mean, if we don't even under, if we're not thinking along these lines, we're never gonna really understand the sampling distribution. So what's he really doing? Or what does he wanna know? Are we all in the same room? <laughs> Max, what does he want to know? Does he want to know the uh, proportion of the sampling? He does. I mean, he wants to know the proportion of the population. But what about, what, what proportion is he looking for? Let's go back. Those 20%. It's one thing to be in the class, and it's another thing uh, to like really uh, The uh, sampling distribution for proportions and the sampling distribution for means. Let's talk about how we get those things. So imagine, uh, let's talk about uh, proportions first. Suppose that I told you, or we knew that 20% uh, of the people were sexy and they knew it. So let's suppose 20% of the people are sexy and they know it. Actually out there in the pot. So what does he want to know in the population? How many people think that they're sexy and they know it? That's his question, isn't it? That's what he wants to know about the population. <coughs> and he's giving you an example. He's saying, let's just say that the proportion of people who feel uh, who are sexy and they know it, he said, let's just say it's 0 0.20 or 20%. Are we okay with that? That's what he's doing. That's what he wants to do. Population. So that would be the parameter. The actual population, 20% 20, 20 of the people were sexy and they know it. So I say P equals 0.20, okay? The proportion. P is the proportion of the population. But if I go out and take a sample of 100 people, do you think exactly 20 people will be sexy and they know it? Do you think that's going to happen? No, because if I take this sample over here, maybe only 18 people are sexy and they know it. If I take another sample, a random sample again, maybe only 20, maybe 17 are. Then I take another sample, maybe 24 are. But most of those samples, close to about 20, will be sexy and they'll know it. So um, that number, 20 over 100, or 22 over 100, or 21 over 100, would be the proportion in my sample. A sample proportion is known as a p-hat. So if you can imagine this, me going out, me showing, I'll show you a little scale here, and we get about 20, 25, 30, 15, and 10%. I'm going to go out and I'm going to take a random sample of 100 people. So ready? Here's 100 people. Oh, in this sample, 
this random sample, 18 out of the 100, which is 18%, were sexy and they knew it. So right around 18, I'm going to put a little P hat. And then I take another sample, and I find out in that sample, 22% was sexy and they knew it. So 22%, I put another... Why does he keep getting different percentages when he picks different samples? Why? Tell me loud so I can hear it. I'm kind of old and deaf. Go ahead. It's okay. It's anybody. Well, it never be the same. Uh huh. What? Be the same. Because he, right, because no two samples are going to be identical, right? And what's he trying to show us here? He's trying to show us that if he keeps picking samples, right, none of them are going to be the same because no two samples are going to be identical, but most of them are going to cluster around the middle, right? Yeah. And then I go take another random sample of 100 people, and of those 100 people, 24 were sexy and they knew it. So 24%. And then the next sample I take, 27% were sexy and they knew it. And the next sample I take, 14% uh, were sexy and they knew it. And I, then, I, then I throw them all back in and I take another random sample of 100 people, and I find, you know, 16%, six, six, uh, then another random sample. And I just take random samples, and I keep getting a bunch of P hats which are my sample proportions, okay? As opposed to P, which is the population, the truth. But if I go take a sample, it's not gonna be, it's most likely not gonna be exactly in the same proportion as the, as the population. But uh, notice that I think different samples have different proportions. Why? Because they're different. They're, they're not the same people, so it's not a group of 100 people. So just because I take a sample and find 18% of something uh, of the sample is, is has this quality, I don't say, well, I know for sure that the parameter is 18%. So will we ever know for sure what the parameter of a population is? Will we, yes or no? What do you think? Take a guess. You could be right 50% of the time. Anybody in the back? Yes or no? Could we know it? No. You can never really know it. But what we learn in statistics is that we can estimate it. Right? And that's what's going on here. Because we know samples vary. And if you did an experiment in your class and you took like handfuls of beads and calculated the proportion that were green or something like that, notice if you keep if you do that and take many handfuls, you're not gonna have the exact proportion of green all the time. And it's gonna be a different handful. This thing that goes back and forth, these little p hats, the way they vary, is called sampling variability. It's also known as sampling error, even though you didn't make a mistake. It's just the natural variability between statistics. Statistics are the numbers you calculate from a sample. So all of these p hats are statistics. But notice, if I keep doing this over and over and take another sample and another sample, what shape do you notice? Most of my p hats are pretty close to the true p. Most of my p-hats are pretty close to the true p. As a matter of fact, if I keep doing this infinitely, I end up getting something that looks like this. I think, I think, I think you've seen this before. Something that's, well, that's not perfect. Bring it over here. Something that ends up being normal-ish, symmetric, centered at the true p. It's amazing. All of these p-hats, if I take a p-hat, another p-hat, another p-hat, many of them are really close to the true p. Okay, so if we, pick an inf if we pick an infinite number of samples from the population, right, like he's doing here, he's not going to do an infinite number, but he's giving you an example. If we pick an infinite number of samples, the proportion of that infinite number of samples will be identical to the true population mean. And... Remember, this is theoretical. We said it in the last class. The sampling distribution is theoretical. It doesn't exist in reality because we can never pick an infinite number of samples. But if we did pick an infinite number, what's he telling you? You'll get a normal-shaped curve, and the peak of that curve, which is the mean, and it's the median and the mode, right, will be identical to the population parameter that you are trying to estimate. Is anybody not clear on that? Some are a little bit away, some are both, but most of them are near there. And what ends up, ends up happening is you end up getting a sampling distribution. So this thing right here that I got from sampling and sampling and sampling and sampling and sampling is a sampling distribution. You get it from sampling and sampling all the way through. So this distribution, this histogram of all of these p is a sampling distribution for proportions. It's a bunch
bunch of statistics, a bunch of key... Remember, by the way, what he just said, he said this is a, that what he drew, this histogram, right? Remember how we got the normal curve just way back when, when we did histograms and we found the midpoints of each bar on the histograms and then we connected the dots of those, we made a line graph, right? Well, he's, if you keep collecting samples and you create a histogram and then you found the midpoints and drew the line, you'd get something that looks like a normal shape curve. This is the mathematical theory that's behind this, right? All of this, by the way, is so important because it's, this is what's going to allow us to make an inference from a sample to a population. This concept of the sampling distribution, I can't emphasize it enough, is so foundational to, to statistics. It's not hard, but it's hard. I don't know how it's okay. Piled. They're piled. And notice the pile is right around the true P. And what's even cooler about this, it can be derived mathematically, is that the standard deviation from this is actually given to you right on your formula sheet. Two things are given to you on your formula sheet. This next couple of words here you can not worry about because we don't have his formula sheet. And so don't worry about it. He's going to calculate for a minute or two some things that we don't need to worry about. It says the mean of all the P hats is simply the true P. So the mean of this model is 0 0.20, which is the true P of the population. And what also is given to you on your formula sheet for the AP test is that the standard deviation of all the P hats is simply the square root of P, Q over N. So I can find the standard deviation of this thing by using my calculator, P, Q over F. Square root, P, Q, divided by, I know this goes up to 0 0.04. But this P, 0.2, Q, which is... Don't worry how he got that. ...probability of failure, 0 0.8, these add up to 1, over N, 100. I find out that the standard deviation of my P hats, in this case, is 0 0.04. So I have a normal... The standard deviation of the P hats, or the P's of the samples, your, your author again calls it P subscript S, the standard deviation. So what he's saying, he's, he, by pulling an infinite number of samples, he's created a bell-shaped curve, right, that has a standard deviation, which we'll deal with how to figure it out later, right? And it also has three standard deviations to the right of the mean and three standard deviations to the left of the mean. And we have one sample finding. Right? And we have one sample finding. Let me just... Uh, because in real life, by the way, we don't pick an infinite number of samples, right? We just pick one sample, right? So if he kept... If, if you did what that guy did on the video, and you created this sampling distribution, If you kept doing it, you would know that the mean, right, the mean of this, the mean of the sampling distribution, remember we wrote that in the last class, mu was subscript x bar, right? The mean of the sampling distribution would be the same as the population parameter, okay? The population p. All right? Now, you're going to pull one, one sample because we're never going to do this, right? In real life, we pull one sample. He's talking about the proportion of uh, people who felt like they were sexy and they knew it. And he, he said, well, let's say it was 20%, 0.20, right? He got a score of 0.20. Once he figures out the standard deviation, which we'll do another time, right? What can you do with this score? Once we know the standard deviation, right? The score minus the mean divided by the standard deviation helps you to convert the score into a z-score. That's what you did on the last test, right? Once you have the z-score for the sample, you could locate that somewhere on this line, couldn't you? Once you, have the, once you turn the sample into a z-score, the sample finding into a z-score, you could locate it here. If that z-score ends up down here, in this shaded area, it's a rare event, isn't it? 
try to remember these things because this is really going to lead us into the next chapter on confidence intervals and so on. But the whole point is, in real life, we pick one sample. Then we want to evaluate that one sample against the sampling distribution that we don't really create. We just know it theoretically. And to do anything with our sample finding, <coughs> this curve, <coughs> we've got to convert the raw score of our, of our sample into a z-score. And once you do that, once you turn it into a z-score, you can locate it along this line somewhere. OK? Is that OK or not? If it's not OK, I don't know what to do. <laughs> we'll go out for chicken minis. Or okay. Bottle centered at P with a standard deviation of 0.04. P, I go up 0.04, 4%. So notice if I stop drawing my lines, I go up another to 28. About 68% of my P hats will be between 16% and 24%. How did he get 16 and 24? Well, 20 was the mean, right? 20 was the mean. The standard deviation was 0.04, I guess, right? And he subtracted that from 20, and then he added it to 20, right? So between negative 1 and positive 1, this was a question on your last test too, right? Something similar. Between a negative 1 and a positive 1 standard deviation, there are about 68.28% or 26%, whatever it is, of the area under the curve, right? About 95% of my PS will be between 28% and 12%. So the same thing happens. You have 68% within one standard deviation, which is 4% within 4%. You have 95% of the PS will be within two standard deviations. Kind of cool. The other sampling distribution is you have to imagine some population um, out there. You suppose that, uh, what was I using for an example? Oh, suppose the average student texts. Uh, suppose we know that the true mean, the number of texts a student sends uh, during one of my class, during an AP class, is about 30, with a standard deviation, a population standard deviation of 10. So he's giving you those numbers, but in real life, we wouldn't know what the population mean is. That's what we are trying to estimate. Okay? So if I, if I you know, randomly took um, some students and I found this, I randomly took 100 students and I calculated the average that they took during class. If we know the population average is 30 per class, the average student texts 30 times per class, and I grab 100 students, are, they gonna, are those 100 students going to have an exact average of 30 texts per day? No. Maybe there's a couple super texters in there that text like hundreds of times. They just text the whole class. You know who you are. You like that. You sit at your desk and you do the old green back and then... Okay? We know who you are. But maybe there's a few of those who brings the average up to, you know, 35 or something in that group of 100. But you have to imagine what the sampling distribution looks like. It looks like this. I go out and I take... So here we go. 30. <coughs> And I go out and I take, a, I take a sample and I find that the average in this group is 30, 30.5 or something. There's my X bar. The X bar is my sample, sample mean. It's a statistic. So I go out and take a sample, I find about 30. The sample mean is a statistic, not a population parameter, right? That, these words are important. The sample mean is a statistic. A statistic is an estimator of the population parameter or the population characteristic, right? A little over 30. I think I have a sample. There weren't that many texts. I found, I found like 28. So let's just go up one and down one. And I just keep going up and I keep getting X bars. This, this sample had a ton of texters in it. People that text a lot. I took another sample. There weren't that many texters. But in most of my samples, the average number of texts per class is about 30. And it should be. And what ends up happening here, again, is that most of these X bars are near the true mu. And that pile of X bars, they all pile up around the true mu and they end up being like this, something like that, a whole bunch of X bars, normal-ish, again, as long as the sample size is large enough for you know the underlying population is normal -ish. anyway. Well, he just flipped out there like a used car salesman, right? Mm -hmm. He's saying that if you keep picking samples, 
right, whether it's a proportion, in this case it's a mean, right, that you'll end up with a normal shape as long as the sample sizes are large enough, which was one of our theorems, right, which was one of our theorems that we talked about. Let's see, make sure we understand it. It's on page 153, the central limit theorem, right? That theorem, what does the central limit theorem tell us? The central limit theor theorem tells us, it, I'll read it to you. If repeated samples of size n are drawn from any population with a mean and a standard deviation, then as n becomes large, the sampling distribution of sample means will approach normality. So one of the things we talked about in the last class is that we never really know if the population that we're pulling our sample from is normal in shape. We don't really know that. But the central limit theorem tells us that we don't really have to worry too much about that as long as our sample size is big enough. Your author says at least 100, right? But that can vary. The bigger, the better. The bigger the sample, the better. But the X bars all land near the true mu, true mu. And we know, given on our formula sheet tells us this, that the mean of all the X bars is just the true mean of the population. So all the X bars are centered around the true mean. And the standard... The, the mean of all the X bars, right? This is the sampling distribution. This is the mean of a sampling distribution of sample means. Make sense? This here is the mean, a sampling distribution, the mean of the sampling distribution of sample means. If it was, and, and he's not talking about this right now. What's the eraser? Oh, there it is. All right. And he's using P with a little hat, right? But I also said that your author calls the proportions, the samples of proportions P with a little s, right? Then this is the mean <coughs> of an infinite number of sample proportions. Okay? That's how you would write that. Which is never created in reality because the sampling distribution is theoretical. of all the X bars, the formula is given to you, is the population standard deviation divided by the square root of sample size. So suppose I'm, I, my sample is 100, then I can find the standard deviation of all these X bars, the standard deviation of all these X bars, sorry, is the population standard deviation of 10 with a square root 100, which is 10. And by the way, you'll never know the population standard deviation, right? You don't, we never really know that. He's using this as an example. So he's saying, make believe we know that the true mean is 30 in the upper right-hand corner, right? And, we, and make believe that we know that the standard deviation for the population is 10, okay? But in real life, we wouldn't know that. That is what we are trying to guess, right? We're trying to estimate that by drawing one sample and then using the sampling distribution to locate our one sample someplace to see where it falls, to see how much we can trust our one sample, the accuracy of it. 10 over 10, which is 1. So 31, 32, 29, 28, and if I go up like this, I find that if I go up one standard deviation and down one standard deviation, 68% of my X bars, if I took sample and sample, remember I'm taking a sample, calculating an X bar, putting it here. Sample, calculating an X bar, putting it there. This pile of X bars is a sampling distribution. I didn't get it from one sample. I got it from sampling and sampling and sampling. 68% within one standard deviation. 95 within two of those things, those standard deviations. 99.7 within three, about approximately normal. So just remember what a sampling distribution. It's not the distribution of a sample, because the distribution of a sample is just a history. You take a sample and make a histogram. It's not the distribution of a population. Those are a bunch of individuals. It's this. Taking a sample, 
calculating a statistic from that sample and putting it over here in a little list. You can make sampling distributions from any attribute you calculate. By the way, to me, that's a, he said it really well, and that's probably one of the most important parts of this video, right? He's explaining to you and, re, and, and emphasizing to us, right, the difference between a sample, a population, and a sampling distribution. And we have to remember that that sampling distribution is the key to life. It's the key, it's the thing that makes inferential statistics work. Right? Right from a sample. You can make a sample, a sampling distributions of a sample standard deviation, of sample medians. The same thing. But what you're doing is you're calculating something from a sample, putting it down, taking another, taking a new sample, putting it down, taking a sample, grabbing the next bar, putting it down, taking another sample, grabbing the next bar, or taking a sample, calculating the p hat, writing it down, calculating taking another sample. It's a bunch of p hats. It's a bunch of statistics taken from a bunch of samples. So if you imagine a pile of p hats, that pile is a sampling distribution. It comes from sampling. Or if you can think of a pile of x bars, those x bars are sampling distribution. I can be crazy. I can be, you know what? I'm going to go out and I'm going to make a new sampling distribution. I'm going to make a sampling distribution of sample medians. And I go and take a sample and I calculate the median and I write it down. And I go take another sample and I calculate the median and I write it down. And I have a pile of medians. Well, that'll be a sampling distribution for, for sample medians. I got it from sampling. So don't confuse with the other thing. Just remember, a sampling distribution comes from sampling and sampling and sampling. It's a, it's a distribution of a bunch of statistics. The statistics are generally piled around the parameter, the truth in the population. Good luck. And again, I'll, I'll email these to you. Um, I got a bunch of them from uh, what I looked at the other day, and I'll, I'll take them all and I'll just send them all to you. Uh, and some of them are rather boring. And um, you just got to slog through it and, and try to make sure you understand it. This is the key, okay? You have a sample. You produce a raw score from something about your sample. <coughs> whether it be the mean of a sample or a population of the sample, an average of the, of the sample, excuse me, I didn't mean to say population. So you work, you're working with a sample. You can calculate the proportion of a variable in a sample. For example, how many men, what's the proportion of men to women, the proportion of Protestant, Catholic, Jews, and others, or whatever. Or you can take an average of a sample, right? The mean average of a sample. And when you get that number, you get a score. And then we have to convert that score into a Z score in order to locate it on this theoretical sampling distribution. Right? Because what's coming up, by the way, is something called confidence intervals. And we're going to build an interval to see where did our Z score that we produced from our sample finding fall on this curve? How confident can we be that it's correct? What's the margin of error? Right? That's what we want to know. So let's now turn to uh, chapter 7 again, where we talked about bias and efficiency, because there's a little lead in there talking about proportions sample proportions and sample means, but then on 164 starts the interesting part, I think, called the interval estimation procedures, and then following that, um, there should be a section on, on uh, conf constructing confidence intervals. So last class we left off um, around page 161 when we were talking about bias and efficiency, right? And I'm going to read the bias section here on page 161. An estimator is unbiased if its mean, I'm sorry, if, it's, if the mean of its sampling distribution is equal to the population value of interest. So if we created a sampling distribution, right, like he was just doing, and putting a whole bunch of sample means or a whole bunch of sample proportions 
on a histogram and creating this normal curve. If we were to do that, right? And if that sampling distribution's mean was I identical to the population, or is it the P, the population, right, mean, then we would know that our, pop, our, our estimator is not biased. It would, in other words, it would be accurate, right? Not a hard concept. That's not hard to understand. We, and next, continuing, we know from the theorems presented in the previous chapter, chapter six, that sample means meet this criteria. The mean of the sampling distribution of sample means, and he notes what it is, and I wrote it uh, somewhere up there before. I guess I erased it, right? The, the, um, the, the dis sampling distribution of sample means is the same as the population mean. So what's important for us to remember? Mathematically, uh, in a formula, right? The mean of the population is equal to the mean of the sampling distribution, right? That's important for us to know. Which, by the way, the other thing, the other average, the other mean we're calculating is the sample mean. Right? And we're trying to use this to guess that, which we don't know. But according to the theorems that we learned, we can use this go through this, the sample distribution, to estimate or guess about that. Since this won't be, this finding won't be exactly the same as that, we have to also, we would like to estimate how wrong, how incorrect, what's the margin of error, right, that finding is. What I just drew here, by the way, in this little example, is not really any different than what we looked at in your book. I think it was six, figure 6.2. We had the population. We had the sampling distribution. And then we had the sample. Right? We're trying to use the sample to guess about that. In order to guess about that, we have to work with the sampling distribution in order to give us an idea of how good or bad our sample finding is compared to the, the real value, the real population value. OK, next paragraph says, sample proportions are also unbiased. So what do we know? That Sample means, if we keep picking them, according to the mathematicians, are, they're not biased. They're, they're a good statistic to use. The other statistic that we're going to use in this class that your author uses is a sample proportion. So sample mean, sample mean is not biased. And a sample proportion It's not biased, okay? Those are the two uh, estimators that we're going to use. Sample proportions, which he labels as P subscript S. In the video, the guy was calling it P hat, right? So you might also see it called P with a bar on top, all right? So sample proportions are also unbiased. If we calculate sample proportions, from repeated random samples of size n, the sample distribution of sample proportions will have a, mean, a, 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 a population mean, a proportion mean for the population, equal to the population proportion. And by the way, he calls the population <coughs> proportion out there, the parameter, P subscript U, your author does, U signifying universe, the universe. Okay. Thus, if we are concerned with coin flips, right, and sample honest coins 10 at a time, so you flip a coin 10 times, n equals 10, and 
the sampling distribution will have a mean equal to 0.5, which is the probability that an honest coin will show heads or tails when flipped. Of the statistics commonly used in social research, only sample means and sample proportions are unbiased. So those are the two statistics that we are using in this book and in your class. A sample mean and a sample proportion is not a biased estimator of what the true population proportion is or the true population mean is. Because sample means and sample proportions are unbiased, we can determine the probability that they are within a certain distance of the population value that we're trying to estimate. Remember what he did in the video, right? He, had, uh, he was able to locate all of his sample proportions or sample means along this line, right? And when he did that, he drew this theoretical sampling distribution, and he also drew the standard deviation lines, three to the right and three to the left of the mean. And he, and he was able to tell us if, you know, if my, if my sample mean is 20, for example, um, it, it, he actually said it fell within about 68% of the true value of the population, which he gave to us, all right? He gave to us in his example. So let's go back to the text. Because sample means and sample proportions are unbiased, you can determine the probability that they're within a certain distance of the population value that you're trying to estimate, right? He, he showed us that. He showed us what the true value was, and then he showed us the range where 68% of the sample means fell. To illustrate, consider a specific problem. Assume that we wish to estimate the average income of a community. A random sample of 500 households is taken, so n equals 500. And the sample mean from the 500 is $45,000, okay? So we got a sample of 500 people, we take the average of their income and we get $45,000. In this example, the population mean is the average of all the households in the community. We're only working with 500, not the whole community, right? And the sample mean is the average for the 500 households that happen to be selected for the sample. Note that we do not know the population mean. We don't know mu, the population mean, at this point. If you did, you wouldn't need to take a sample, he goes on to say. So then the last paragraph on that page the two theorems presented in chapter six give us a great deal of information about the sampling distribution of all possible sample means in this situation. So we pulled one sample of 500 people, we took an average of their income and came up with $45,000, right? If I put those 500 back and pulled another 500 people, I probably wouldn't get exactly 4,500, right? And if I kept doing that an infinite number of times, I'd probably keep getting different numbers. But as I kept doing that and calculating the average income, if you remember what the person was saying on the video, the, the, the uh, average incomes from each sample would stack up in the middle. Would stack up in the middle. Let's continue with the example. The two theorems presented in chapter six give you a great deal of information about the sampling distribution of sample means. Because n is large, and your author wants at least 100, in this example it's 500, right? We know that the sampling distribution is normal and that it has a mean equal to the mean, to population mean. So because the sample size is large enough, we can presume that income is normally distributed in the community. That's the central limit theorem. That's in the previous chapter, right? So ultimately, whatever the sampling distribution produces as the average income, because of the central limit theorem and the mathematics and the laws of probability, whatever this ends up being, it will be equal to the population parameter. What's our problem, though? What's our problem? Our problem is we only are dealing with one sample, not an infinite number of samples. So we don't know how far off the center our one sample is. And so this is all about, one more time, this is all about estimating how confident we can be that our one sample is close to the real number. That's where we're going with this. 
And this is the case with any sample. And I keep saying this because it's so important to all of us in the medical world, right? When we come up with a new uh, drug or a new protocol for a particular treatment and so on, we do the work on samples and we find something out about a sample. What proportion of the sample got well? What proportion died? You know, what proportion had their ear fall off or from a side effect, we, right? We, we do it on a sample. And for each one of those findings about that sample, we want to estimate what would it really be like on the whole population. We use this very technique to make that estimate, which I think is really sharp and really important and really powerful. And probably, you know, the only reason why everybody should have a basic understanding, should be, uh, be literate in statistics. I mean, it's an ugly class, and I know people don't love it, and they don't like being here, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, it's super important. Not that you do it, but that you understand what's going on, right? Everything we do with a drug was done on a sample. It wasn't done on everybody. It was done on a sample, and they came up with some averages of success or failure, and then the Food and Drug Administration makes a decision. We do it about things that have to do with air pollution, right, and drilling for oil and fracking. These are all done on samples to make estimates about the true population parameter. And we make the estimates about the true population parameter by using the sampling distribution, taking our one little lousy sample and locating it somewhere on this line after it's converted into a z-score to see what the probability is that it would have fallen close to the, mean, to the mean of the real population. Does any of that make any sense a little bit at least? Don't say yes if, you don't, if, if that's not true. But uh, I hope it does because this is really important to you and to understanding where we're going next with this. Because I, I actually think it's pretty cool what happens next, which we figure out using confidence intervals, um, how people come up with these estimates about who's going to win an election, which drug's going to work better, how many, what, what program will teach people to read better or make educational outcomes improve or, or criminal justice programs, like which ones will reduce recidivism rates and on and on. All use this very important technique. Okay, listen, that's it for today. I'll see you Monday. Have a beautiful weekend. And um, hang in there and watch the videos that I'm going to send you, which I think I'll do right now before I leave the class.